Hi everyone, welcome to the CamCat booth chats. My name is Helga Scheer, I'm the editorial director of CamCat Books, and I'm here with some of our authors, some of my favorite authors. You will hear me gushing the whole time. Uh, Michael Bradley, the award-winning author of Dead Air, returns to us with none, uh, with none Without Sin, an awesome first in the First State Mysteries, and it will be released on um, July 12th this year. Joel Brawford will talk about um, Heroes Ever Die, which will re release in August, um, on August 16, as the sequel to Jove Brand is Near Death. Kayana Waters will introduce her debut, uh, The Dead Won't Tell, a Southern mystery that will be published in September, September 20th. Uh, Jen Delogier, uh, J.L. Delogier, is here with her paranormal mystery, The Photo Thief which will release in October, October 18, 22. Kelly Murphy has brought her sister's death, also a paranormal mystery. That will release in December, December 13, 22. And last but not least, Marcy McCreary is here to chat about the Ford Family Mystery Series, which thus far consists of The Disappearance of Trudy Solomon, which is available now in hardcover and audio and ebook, and it will be available in paperback this fall. And it's uh, the second in the series, The Murder of Madison Garcia, which will be forthcoming in March 2023. Uh, welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, before we dive in, I want to handle just a few housekeeping issues. The session is being recorded. If you are a visitor, please mute yourself. If you have questions for the panelists, feel free to post them in the chat. I will pick them up and ask them for you. So. We only have about 45 minutes to chat, and this is a very big panel. So I'd like to give our authors a chance to quickly introduce themselves and give us um, a quick rundown of your books. So perhaps, uh, Michael, you are the veteran. Uh, can you maybe get us started with this? Yeah, sure. My name is Michael Bradley. Um, this, uh, uh, as uh, Helga said, my, uh, my third book, which came out uh, a couple of years ago called Dead Air, uh, picked up a couple of awards last year. And the follow a new book uh, that I have coming out this year uh, in July is called None Without Sin. Um, it is a mystery, as Helga said, it's the first in the uh, First State Mystery Series. Um, and it features uh, Brian Wilder, who's a small town newspaper journalist. He's uh, trying to discover the scoop on the meaning of a mysterious loaf of bread that was left with the corpse of a murdered local real estate mogul. Um, now, Reverend Candace Miller, who is a, a, a uh, local minister in the, in the the town is called to minister to the grieving family. Now she realizes the killer has adopted the symbolism of a Victorian era religious ritual called sin eating as the calling card. Um, the two of them have to team up, and as more victims fall, uh, Brian and Candace are following a trail of deceit and blackmail, hoping to identify the killer while their own sins won't catch the killer's attention. Awesome. Yes. Talk about morally great characters. You sure have them in your book all over. It's an awesome mystery. Um, you know, yeah. Joe, do you want to go next? <laughs> sure. So uh, I write the Ken Allen series. Ken is a D-list private detective for celebrities. In his inaugural adventure, he's framed for murder and finds himself drawn into his worst nightmare, reliving his history as badly playing a super spy but this time if he doesn't get it right he's going to prison for the rest of his life because he's been framed for murder uh so we went to series very excited and the book coming out in august is heroes ever die and it is about a killer who begins murdering the actors who play superheroes in superhero films and ken is on the case to discover who the killer is and why he has it out for these people who are in costume on film. Awesome. Thank you very much. Talk about, you know, being able to depict to depict this the the setting, this town in where um, you know, the heroes ever die plays, of course, is a thinly disguised Hollywood, California. And boy, did you peg that. I live in in Los Angeles, so gosh, I recognize even myself in this book. So awesome, <laughs> awesome sense of place. Jen, oh, can you. I ask? Sorry? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Jen, can you please uh, go next and introduce your awesome book? 
Sure, thanks. So The Photo Thief is my fifth book, and it is my first gothic paranormal murder mystery, to use a lot of descriptors. Um, in it, a grieving detective is investigating a socialite's fatal fall down her Philadelphia mansion stairs. The socialite's daughter claims that her mother was murdered, and she knows this because vintage photographs hanging on the mansion's walls have told her so. Uh, she claims she can talk to the dead through the photos. So Brennan is drawn into this wealthy family's uh, history of madness and murder, and he soon faces a choice. He has to decide whether he should um, label the socialite's fall as an accident or um, and perhaps sacrifice his credibility in his career or have the unbelievable chance to maybe talk to his dead daughter again. This is awesome. I hope we get a chance to talk about the paranormal aspects um, in, in your story and obviously also in, in Kelly Murphy's story. Kelly, would you like to introduce your sister's death? Sure. Um, my story uh, opens with a journalist who um, has found out that her sister has died in a swanky hotel in Baltimore and the police believe it is suicide. Uh, she does not believe it, and she meets a stranger, a former homicide detective, who has enough connections to the hotel that they pair up to try to figure out the mystery of what happened to her sister. The story alternates um, with 1921 and a young woman who is getting married to an older man, and the same hotel is featured in that story, and the dual timelines do come together at the end with a possibly paranormal paranormal element um, that helps solve the mystery. Yes, it's a truly chilling ultimate reveal, you know, very, very surprising ultimate reveal as well. You know, it's, it's absolutely awesome. Kayana, can I ask you to talk a little bit about The Dead Won't Tell? Sorry, I do this all the time. I'm Kayana Waters and my debut, the, the Dead Won't Tell, is coming out in September of this year. The Dead Won't Tell is a dual mystery. The first one involves a failed PhD candidate who was hired by the local newspaper to investigate a cold case that happens to be connected with her uh, college mentor that actually flunked her in her orals and, and is the reason why she doesn't have her PhD. The other is her uh, college buddy turned documentarian, turned amateur chef who <laughs> got his uh, show canceled and so comes to the town of Hunts Landing looking for a new story that he can pitch to the network. So he is following the clues of um, Civil War gold while, uh, while Abby is following the cold case and meanwhile the killer from the cold case in 1969 is chasing them both. Awesome, awesome, awesome story. Marcy, last but not least, please take it away. Uh, so my uh, series, which is uh, the disappearance of Trudy Solomon and the murder of Madison Garcia, pairs a detective named Susan Ford with her father, retired detective Will Ford. And the setting of the novel is the Catskills region, the Borscht Belt region of New York. And so the storied hotels that uh, eventually uh, declined and went away uh, is a big part of the story because it affects uh, the area and sort of the characters within that area. In The Disappearance of Trudy Solomon, we are looking at a cold case, a case that retired detective Will Fort could not solve. But when new clues come to light, Susan Ford is on the case. So together they begin to run down what happened to Trudy Solomon and sort of unearth a lot of um, murder and mayhem along the way. In The Murder of Madison Garcia, it is a current day murder. Uh, a woman is stabbed in her car by Sackett Lake but it has implications to the past. And so her father, again, he's more of a reluctant, uh, there's more of a reluctant pairing in the second book uh, because of his relationship with the victim's family. He becomes entangled in Susan's case to find out what happened to Madison Garcia. 
Awesome. Thank you. Yes, the relationship of past um, and present is, is actually prevalent in all of your stories. So hopefully we can touch about that, uh, upon that as well. Thanks to all of you um, for giving that uh, quick introduction. Um, as I've been gushing many, many, many times in house, this is really a very strong list of mystery. Everyone who knows me knows I'm a mystery fan, but I really am a fan of these mysteries. So on the surface, your books solve intricate mysteries, but that's not all. You also explore themes that really pack a punch for the reader. Um, racial stereotypes, social hierarchies, guilt, forgiveness, loss, grief, doubt are among the many issues that your uh, characters have to grapple with. I do hope to touch upon all of that, um, but above all, your books offer awesome edge of your seat and nail biting thrills and chills. So let me maybe dive in with a first quick question. What is it that inspired your novel? Um, Kelly, can I ask you first? And please, anyone jump in at any time. Uh, mine is actually easy because I attended a conference where I saw Makita Brotman, I never say her name correctly, um, speaking about her nonfiction book uh, about a murder in Baltimore called An Unexplained Death. She had seen a flyer on a pole in her neighborhood with a man in a tux and he was missing at the time. He was found dead um, at the top of a building where they said he had fallen off a, you know, from a one level to the other. Um, and the cause of death was never ever determined. Did he commit suicide or was he murdered? is never actually solved. And I got intrigued by that idea of, could it be suicide or is it something else? And also in a venue that's historic, that has a lot of history and this building did as well. So that was sort of a jumping off point for me. Mm, awesome, thank you. Oh, anyone else? Next, next, next. Jen, go ahead, yes. So I was actually uh, many years ago out to lunch and NPR was playing on the radio and they were talking about photo thieves who are were skinny young men back in the 1930s that newspapers like the Philadelphia Inquirer um, hired to break into people's houses and steal family photos off the pianos and the walls. And these photos were stolen from homes that had experienced grisly murders. And so the newspapers wanted those photos to run in the newspaper with their sensational, you know, articles about the murders. And it occurred to me at the time that those same young men would then go off to World War II in the 1940s. And it made me think about sort of the, how would that affect these people psychologically, you know, home, breaking into homes of grisly murders and then going off to war. And whatever happened to those photos. And it, that's what sort of percolated for a, a long time and eventually turned into the photo thief, which is set in current times because I was too lazy to write a historical, but the, um, the history is is prevalent throughout the book. Okay, awesome, awesome. Thank you. That I, would is say, I would say I'm very similar to both Kelly and Jen in sort of, I was inspired by real life events that brought me to the Trudy Solomon novel, which was that, a woman went missing in the 1970s, um, and um, and there was a, there was a, a murder, a current day murder that when they unearthed the body, the cops just assumed it was Trudy Solomon. The age mapped out, then they did a quick social security search, and they actually and they actually pinged in Massachusetts at an Alzheimer's facility, and they found Trudy Solomon. And all I could think about is, okay, so what? what happened to her, you know, in those, in those years, in those 40 years she was missing, but she couldn't tell them because she had Alzheimer's and it just absolutely just got stuck in my brain. And the idea that I would love to fill in the sort of like what happened to her. And, and I, then I thought about my own experiences in the Catskills and my father being what was called a tumbler uh, at the Brickman Hotel, uh, meaning he was the activities director. And sort of, so there was always this sort of like father daughter, like sort of thinking that went on along with this true story. And so that's how my story evolved. The inspiration for the murder of Madison Garcia is so like boring compared to that in that I got a phone call, one of those unknown numbers, you know, that show up on your phone and you, you ignore it. And because you always think, well, if it's important, they'll leave a voicemail. Um, so I got the number and I got some strange voicemail associated with it. And I was like, oh, my God, I should probably 
do a reverse lookup and I did a reverse lookup and I kind of figured out who it was and where she called from through Facebook. And then I was like, what if, what if a police officer or a detective got a phone call like this and the next day that person turned up dead? Oh. And, th and so that, that was the inspiration for this story. You know, just a personal strange experience. That's actually awesome. I don't think I knew that, although I've, you know, I, I've talked to you many times, but I don't think I knew that. That's awesome. I think I put it in the manuscript notes. I think. Oh, uh, you might have. Yes, you might have. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Kalyana, can I ask you for the inspiration to your, to your novel? Sure. Uh, I used to live outside of Huntsville, Alabama, which is where the U.S. Space and Rocket Center is and where the Army brought German rocket scientists back to the US after World War II. And um, those scientists were instrumental to building the rockets that got the, the astronauts to the moon and back. And so every year in the anniversary, they, they do big specials and all that. There was a huge parade. And I started like Marcy thinking, what if? What if? Now the events of that parade and, and the fireworks and all take two pages of the novel, the rest went from there, but that, that was the start. What if somebody was murdered while the fireworks were going off after the astronauts landed? Um, yes, but the, 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 it's only two pages, but those two pages reverberate all the way through because you can, as a reader, you can really just see yourself at this party and you, you are just like, oh my God, you know, what, what you, you were there, you were partying with a killer. So it, it's, it is, it is absolutely awesome. Terrific. Joe, you're struggling with your cat there. Uh, can you... <laughs> um, I have a long haired Berman cat and they have a hairball issue. So we were forced to give him a haircut and my wife got him a lion cut because she thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and, tail and, everything. and he knows it and he hates it. <laughs> his, his ego is very yes. damaged. I'm so sure. I'm that, sure. He's neurotic. Um, I love comic books, but uh, even more than that, I was really struck by the idea that these men and women that created characters that now make billions and billions of dollars in movie revenue and merchandising sold their creations for a pittance and most of the people that have worked on the comic book heroes in the last 70 years were worked for higher people they had amazing ideas that became movies and they were also paid a pittance and they get nothing from the movies and i thought what would happen if certain people took true offense to the idea that their personal heroes were so horribly robbed and they wanted to find justice for that. And I also wanted to write a book about who we pick to be our heroes and why we choose them and about how a lot of times your heroes let you down and you kind of never want to meet your heroes. And the book is a series of people having confront who they thought someone was versus who they turn out to be. Yeah. So but it's fun and funny, I swear. It's too serious there. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, you know, your, 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 I mean, uh, your story is so full of humor, but it, it really, it, it manages beautifully to, to bring in these, these themes underneath to really make your readers wonder what is a hero, who is a hero, and who really are my heroes? And what is a superhero? I mean, what's so super about superheroes? So it really, it, it really, it's, it's awesome. But it is a very funny and fast moving mystery um, in the end. Anyway, Michael, where did your story come from? So none of that sin really started years ago when I stumbled across a brief article about the uh, Victorian era ritual called sin eating. Um, I had just, it was just one of those things that was showed up in one of my feeds and I read it and I was like, wow, this is fascinating. This, this obscure um, ritual, you know, of, you know, placing a piece of bread on the chest of a dead, a dying person to absorb their sin and giving it to a sin eater, um, you know, to eat. That all just fascinated me, um, the whole concept. Um, but at the time I had no idea what I was going to do with it, but I saved it. I, you know, did a little bit of research and put my notes aside because I figured, Maybe that'll be something someday. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, I was 
you know, I just finished um, writing my last book, Dead Air, and I was looking for something to write next, trying to come up with some kind of an idea. I knew I wanted to, I had this character, Brian Wilder, who I had written some short stories about many, many years ago, back before I really knew how to write. Um, not that I know how to write now, but, um, um, and I wanted to have a vehicle for him. And so I was like, all right, he's going to be my next protagonist. He's going to be my next main character. Um, and I was kind of toying around with what to do with it. And I came across my notes for, uh, from the sin eating that I had come across like 10 years ago. And I was like, hmm. And then I just started to get things percolating in my head. And I eventually came up with the storyline for what none without sin is. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Those are some absolutely fascinating kernels for a story. It's it's always so interesting for me to hear, you know, where your creative ideas really come from. Michael, if I may just start with you in the next uh, with the next question, because um, you mentioned, you know, your your journalist, all of you, um, all of your MCs have to solve a crime, you know, for whatever reason. But that obviously is the idea of a mystery. But beyond that, they deal with their own issues. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about your MC and how they go about, you know, their, their crime solving and, and how their, their very special personalities and backgrounds, you know, help and hinder them um, in, in their pursuit. Well, so, so with Brian Wilder, he, he's a, a journalist. He, he, at the time, um, you know, in, throughout his career, he was actually a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, um, had worked uh, globetrotting, you know, from, from different magazines, Time, Newsweek, you know, all those different magazines and newspapers. Um, but he faced a very personal tragedy um, several years before the book takes place, which really kind of crushed his career, um, crushed him as well. Um, so he ends up as a small town journalist running a small town newspaper. Um, but at the heart of things, he is still an investigative journalist. He has built that, that habit of doing an investigation, not just writing a news, not writing a newspaper article about, you know, the latest city hall meetings or things like that. But really, he's got this uh, huge background in investigative journalism. Um, and he uses that he takes that even though he's been out of that for a long time, he dusts off those rusty habits and those rusty um, skills and uses those investigative um, capabilities to, to track down, um, you know, to track down the murder, the murderer in None Without Sin. What about your priest? Can you so talk Candace, uh -huh. to Candace, Candace Miller, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to talk about Candace because I, Candace has never done an investigation before. She's never, so for her, it is more digging into her own self, digging into her, the people that she knows um, and just kind of trying to think outside the box. You know, she's uh, the one that comes up with the, the who notices the sin eating symbolism. Um, so she helps with that. And even though she can't remember it from seminar or her seminary, you know, she's digging into, you know, her past to try to find, you know, okay, why does this seem so familiar? Um, and she's asking the questions. So she's really, when it comes to being an amateur sleuth, she is a complete amateur when it comes to being a sleuth. She's never done this before. So she's just going by instinct uh, throughout her entire, throughout the entire book. What I really love about, you know, your book, and I, I'm just going to very briefly say that, is that, you know, the, 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 the sin eating, the, the, um, the, the, the ritual usually means that the sins are absolved. But in your book, of course, that the sins are being punished. And um, the question is, how does the murderer even know about all those little sins that are hidden behind, you know, closed doors and closed windows? And the question for the reader, obviously, is, well, who would know everybody's dirty little secret? Hmm, a priest, a journalist, a town gossip. So even our MCs are not beyond reproach and, uh, and all of that. So I love that about your story because really going all the way through, I was like, oh my gosh, who is the killer here? So anyway, we have a journalist. We have two more journalists in, in, uh, in the MCs here. Kayana, your, your um, MC is, well, she's turning into a journalist. So, Oh, Kayana, you're, you're mute. I'm sorry, there's a plumber upstairs, so I'm, I'm trying to be judicious. Um, 
My MC, Abby, is a, a failed PhD candidate. She did her work in history. Um, so in order to make ends meet, put food on the table, she works as a professional researcher. So she does all the library work and grunt work for the lot for the newspaper. And by a quirk of fate, she gets a chance to work on a story and get a byline. So uh, not knowing, again, she's like Michael's Candace, she's an amateur sleuth. She doesn't know who to talk to. She doesn't know what questions to ask. She doesn't even know how to interview suspects because she's always dealt with the written word. She hasn't dealt with live people. She did her work in colonial history. So her first stops were at the library and the newspaper morgue because she just doesn't know and she stumbles. Uh, she becomes really a flawed character for me when a connection is made between the cold case and her PhD professor that flunked her. And she goes to talk to him and she doesn't like his attitude and immediately she wants to solve this case not for the right reasons, to get back at him. She wants her own little bit of revenge. So she becomes a tenacious little terrier just so she can get him. But I think anybody who's read cold case work or cold, cold case uh, nonfiction knows that the people who do that aren't doing it for uh, fame and, and riches. They're doing it because of empathy with the victim and possibly the uh, survivors. And that that road to the empathy is something that transforms Abby over the course of the book. Yes, absolutely. She's also a mom, which I find, you know, really pretty awesome. And that's good. Can you maybe talk about her, her family background a little bit? Because that features greatly in that story as well. Um, I uh, went to one mystery conference years ago and, and the agents on the panel were saying, sleuths have to be loners. They can't have connections, they can't have this. And that made, kind of irked me a bit. So I was determined to uh, surround people with Abby, and uh, around Abby with people. So she has two teenagers, lost her husband in Afghanistan. She's a war widow. She has a mother figure, uh, a father figure. She has her best friend from college. She has her best friend from growing up. And these characters kind of took a life of their own and they uh as a supporting cast i just i love them <laughs> love them all but uh yeah they sh i she wasn't going to be alone in many ways she is alone because she did lose her husband she lost her parents earlier than that so there is some solitude there but she has this support network around her yes and those those um you know secondary characters if you will form the fabric of the town which also you know is just an awesome backdrop to the novel um kelly you also have a journalist I do. Um, and i i i have to say i love that intro to your book that i was sold <laughs> when i read that so please talk about her <laughs> yes i actually love val so much she yeah. is um a, an investigative journalist focusing on homicides and um, she is very prickly, snarky, and uh, she definitely has an attitude, um, which I loved. But she buries her grief about her sister by focusing on the mystery of her sister's death. Um, what I really loved about her is she thinks she's got this super close relationship with her sister, her younger sister. And they do, but as she recreates her sister's last days before her death, she discovers maybe she didn't know everything about her sister that she thought she did. And this is a very difficult thing for her because she's a very stubborn person who thinks she knows more, knows a lot. So it, that kind of mystery being unraveled was kind of fun to take Val and take some of her prickliness and soften her a little bit. Yes, she, she's an awesome character. Um, as is, you know, the, the detective, quote unquote, sidekick i'm not sure who would be whose sidekick here yeah so, you know that would be that that's can you talk about him just a little bit terry terry's a former homicide detective who retired a little earlier than um one would expect and he is working security but he gets tied in and helps val when he meets her and she breaks down in front of him for reasons she doesn't understand, but he's got a tie to the hotel that more as they get into the mystery becomes apparent. And she questions a lot of times why he's so uncomfortable in the hotel, but he keeps pushing. He's looking for answers, but you don't know why. And the reader doesn't know why until very late in the book. He yes. is, he's a very, but he's a good guy. 
in my mind. Yeah, oh yes, he's. I mean, it's your your detective as well as Jen's detective, you know, are just such good guys. I mean, you know, literally like the guys you you read about and you want to meet them. So, mm -hmm. Jen, can I ask you? Can I ask you about your uh, main characters next? Sure. And actually, it's funny you should say that because I just had one of my um, advanced readers send me an email saying that they have a crush on my on my main character now. So. Still cute. <laughs> um, so, um, so I guess I did him right. And, and a fun fact about him, he's based on Dr. Crow from The Sixth Sense, uh, Bruce Willis's character mm. in the in the movie The Sixth Sense. So, I mean, who wouldn't have a crush on Bruce Willis, right? <laughs> um, so I actually have two main characters. I have the grieving detective who's five-year-old, has just recently died from um, brain cancer. And uh, during her treatments, um, his life fell apart, his, their, his marriage did not survive, his career is hanging by a thread. He's trying to get back into the groove as a homicide detective, but his whole perspective has changed. And he's assigned to this case that I mentioned, the socialites fall down the stairs. The second character, main character is the 18 year old daughter of the deceased um, who has been sheltered and raised in this Philadelphia mansion, staring at these vintage photographs uh, of family murders that her great grandfather, the titular photo thief, has saved for unknown reasons. And the 18 year old has um, a seizure disorder. Um, she's kind of hidden by her wealthy family as being you know, emb an embarrassment to the family. And she is determined to prove that her mother was murdered um, with Brennan's help. Um, again, because these photos, she claims to be able to talk to them and they've told her so. So she and Brennan are teaming up to investigate her mother's murder. It becomes sort of a surrogate father-daughter relationship, as you can imagine. Um, but what Brennan needs to decide is good grief. Is the whole family insane? Is this young lady, is it her seizure medicines? Is it her seizure disorder? Or is she really talking to dead people through vintage photographs? Um, what I had occasion to talk about, you know, pretty much that same group of books this morning in the book bites. Um, and you know, what I, what I really think is so awesome about your book as well as about Kelly's book and, um, Michael's that, you know, the few paranormal aspects that you, that you have in your, in your book, um, will, will certainly make even skeptics like me question whether we are missing parts of reality by just being so realistic and rational all the time. And I absolutely adore that. Um, that I just want to add one more thing, Helga, um, about that Kiana had said uh, about empathy for cold yeah. cases, because this 18 year old, obviously all of these photos that are hanging on the wall are cold cases from the 1920s and 30s. And she is trying to solve them. What else does she have to do as she's locked in this you know, mansion? And it is her empathy as well um, for the deceased and their families that's driving her to solve these cold cases. So I can very much relate to what she said. Yes, absolutely. No, it's it's um, totally true. Um, uh, Marcy, can I talk? To, can you talk about your your um, main characters? I'm leaving Joe for last because that's a very different character. <laughs> Go ahead. So I really wanted to create a contrast between Detective Susan Ford and her father Will Ford, both both in personality for different reasons, but also even the way they go about. Uh, solving cases. They're coming from different places, different generation, but also different methodologies, different technologies. But I really wanted to make sort of their personalities the thing that sort of drives them together and and actually pushes them apart some of the time. And it's sort of that yin and yang that, dr that you know, drives the case forward. Uh, because she is very contemplative. You know, everything she has to think through, which I mean, makes for a good detective, but then he's very sort of from the gut instinct. And so those two types of ways of solving crimes, either they work together or they pull them apart. And so it keeps, you kind of get this kind of waves with them. I've made it even uh, more pronounced in the second book. In the first book, the relationship between Susan and her dad, a it's, 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 it's very a buddy buddy and it makes it kind of fun. Uh, and she's really having issues with her mother. Uh, her mother is an, is an alcoholic. She's grown up under the cloud of a mother who is an alcoholic, which also had a bearing on her personality. She's, you know, filled with anxiety. She's filled with self-doubt. She kind of feels she blames her mother for, you know, for those types of things. 
Um, but in the in the second book, I kind of I mended the relationship between Susan and her mother. I almost call it like Vera's redemption story. I I mend that because there has to be a character arc here, right? So I've mended that their relationship so that you kind of see it on a different plane um, and brought a little bit more strife to her relationship with her dad in the second case. And it's mainly because it's a case that she needs to solve. She's now, a, you know, an active detective on a current case, not a cold case that she was chasing with her dad. And so the difference here is, is he has a connection to the family that she's investigating. And so he is clouded. It, it, this is where his instinct is not really working for him because he's a little bit clouded and biased um, over his sort of connection to this family. Uh, and she has to break through that. She has to say, you know, there's there's just a lot more arguments and a lot more tension, uh, which I think it just makes for a more interesting story uh, in terms of how they go about sort of the things that hold them back from solving this crime uh, to the things that drive them forward in finding the, in solving the crime. I think bias is actually a subject for all of you in all of your stories that all your investigators, you know, are not necessarily, all, you know, uh, they all have their bias, they all have their approach to a story and must learn how to get beyond that. Joe, and I want to get back to that maybe, and also to the, top, the topic of empathy, but Joe, please tell us about Ken Allen. Sure. You know, when I wanted to write a book about superheroes, part of it is about role models. And me and i think a lot of people that write and read we pull our role models from fiction you know i do believe life imitates art i think we find the stories we love and we we emulate them when we think of our heroes so part of the book's journey is ken finding out what the cost of being a hero is and what the cost of sticking to your morality is and uh, he ponders early in the book how many friendships uh, being an ethical person is going to cost him. And, and we start to see that, that cost unfold. I, I love long-running detective fiction, but you start to notice after maybe the 20th Spencer novel that Spencer's killed about 200 people. And it doesn't really seem to be taking a psychological toll on him. Uh, and, uh, I, I thought we just, as readers, we just, it's a conceit. We let it go. But I thought, what if my character was actually un incapable of doing it? What if it was someone who would rather die than kill because the cost to him as a person was too dear. And that wall, that thing that he won't break starts to create a situation in the book where it's going to cost him everything. Okay. Ken Allen is a, uh, can you tell us just a little bit about his background as how he evolved from a, shall we say, never was to who he is as a, de as a detective now? <laughs> so um, Ken was in the wrong place uh, or the right place at the right time, but it ended up being the wrong, the worst thing that ever happened to him. Imagine you were picked out of a crowd by a director and he says, I'm in, a, I'm in a bad situation. You are the spitting image of the main character of this movie that I'm making. We start filming tomorrow. Would you like to be a movie star? And of course, as a young man, he thinks this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I've been, I've been discovered. And uh, he ends up being absolutely horrible and terrible. And they've done everything they could to bury this movie for 15 years, but it will not go away. And he lives in infamy. And uh, I wanted to play a character who, I wanted to write this character who, he's, he's weathered down. He's just been beaten down and worn down. But really what that did to him was it smoothed out all his rough edges and it made him a more empathetic and understanding person rather than turning him bitter. And um, it, I, I hope it makes him likable, but it makes him someone who roots for everybody else rather than, um, you know, a cynical sort of detective. 
Yes, and you've mentioned empathy as well. We don't have much time left, but you know, it's it's because the panel is so big. But we can go over a little because I di I did really like that many of you brought up the subject of empathy because I personally really do believe that empathy is one of the driving forces in fiction, um, and and also kind of what you want to arrive at in your reader. Um, all of your characters have so many faults and flaws, and I just wanted to. Um, you know, to, to have you talk a little bit about that, about, um, you know, the, the way empathy has, has driven your writing career. Um, Jennifer, would you want to start us with that? Yeah, I mean, as I already said, you know, Cassie, even though she's been in such a bad situation, she really feels like these people that she talks to, these murdered souls on the, on the photos, that um, she thinks of them as friends. Um, some of them for better, some for worse. And uh, she really has a pronounced sense of empathy uh, despite everything that has happened to her. And of course, the detective um, losing, he was a hard-boiled homicide detective and his daughter's death just turned him into a puddle of noodles, right? And so he has learned empathy really the hard way um, and uh, has changed his willingness to believe in something that, that, that might be, that he might have completely dismissed um, in, in his past life before his daughter's death. And, you know, I'm, I'm a physician. Um, empathy is one of the most important things we talk about. And, um, you know, I, I tried to bring that into this book. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Kelly. Um, well, I think for, it's easy to have empathy when you lose someone close to you that you love. So you, you're going to have some empathy for Val, but Val herself is the recipient of empathy uh from terry even though she doesn't understand his motives the empathy is real and i think it's a big driver in their relationship and why it works as they're going forward uh, and it definitely keeps the mystery going as to why and what is going on but at, at, at all times you feel this relationship growing and a lot of it is comes from empathy and just caring Kayana, can I ask you, because I feel that empathy, you know, she, she does, um, you know, your Abby does learn empathy and, you know, we even manage to, as a reader, drive towards empathy for the bad guys in your book, if you will. Yeah, yes. Um, and I'll be honest, I didn't start off writing empathy. I didn't start off thinking, oh, wow, Abby's got to have all this empathy for the characters. Um, the characters actually drove most of this backstory and most of this cold case uh, and i've just learned to let them go and just tell the story that they had and abby just could not help but in reacting with these people just almost ingesting their pain over over this cold case so she she learned it over time but yes uh even some of the bad guys we we learned to feel a little bit sorry for at the end but there's more than one bad guy so don't worry about it there's plenty to do. <laughs> yes no that's i mean that's the richness of character that you've all created that there's really you you can follow you you understand you why um your even your bad guys are doing what they're doing michael um empathy is built in at least with you know with you with the various priests that you are presenting to us yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing about Candace, um, I don't want to give too much away, but she struggles, um, she struggles with a couple of different things throughout the book. Uh, one of them is being a sin that's a real embarrassment for her. Um, so she does have um, uh, empathy for just about anybody who, who, you know, is struggling themselves because she is in the throes of that exact same struggle. So, um, so you know that that right there she's got significant empathy and brian uh on the other side is um he's had his he's had a major tragedy in his life that that really has played a um significant role in directing the course of his life over the past few years so when these people are dying when there's murders that are being committed and when there's these terrible things that are happening he can empathize because he's been through similar tragedies and he is still reeling and still suffering from his yeah. own tragedies as well. And then when Candace and Brian meet up, um, they kind of feel that, you know, they kind of feel a, an empathy for each other because they are both struggling as well. Thank you. Marcy, in, in your in your book, that, which is 
kind of a dual narrative. I, you know, with with the for Madison Garcia, I should say, um, you know, it's a dual narrative in the um, in the in the notebooks that we are that we read. And I think to me that was that that was the part of the book that allowed me to have a lot of sympathy with your characters with Madison Garcia. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think, you know, if I look back at the first book, first, like Trudy Solomon book, empathy is a huge theme. And it's almost, it's the lack of empathy that it really is the theme in that those that embrace it, those that kind of figure it out, because I, I don't think empathy is easy. And maybe that's a, a personal experience. I mean, I really, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself the most empathetic person. I have to work at it. And I think it's important to, to walk a day in somebody else's shoes and really feel what they feel uh, in order to in order to just have a better life for myself even um, and may, and you know and be involved in a society and i think what i wanted to make clear in Trudy solomon was that those that embrace empathy who understand what it's like to walk a day in someone else's shoes they are going to triumph and those that do not those that live in their selfish world they are going to get their comeuppance. So I think it was, it was a huge theme in Trudy Solomon. To bring it to light in Madison Garcia was to delve into who is Madison Garcia for the reader to truly understand who she is because she's dead at the beginning of the novel uh, and she's the case that needs to be solved. And yeah, this might sound like a bit of a trope. You, you're getting to know her through a diary. <laughs> you know, sort of she's, she's uh, there's a diary that comes to light and through that diary, and even through how people talk about Madison and more that is revealed about Madison, it is important for the reader to empathize with her plight. And I, I can't give too much, I can't talk too much about it because it gives too much away, but she's dealing with immense guilt over something. Um, and, and so I need to get the reader on board to understand where she's coming from, um, why she did what she did, why she ended up as she did and the decision that she made that actually uh you know uh, caused her murder so uh yeah it's a, it's 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 played up in the book but in a very very different way it's for the reader to feel empathy for madison whereas in the first book it was more about sort of you have empathy you're gonna win you don't have empathy you're gonna lose Yes, Madison is a rather bristly character when we first meet her and the folks who talk about her, about the victim, are not necessarily um, you know, big fans of her. But, you know, your your book manages to to turn that around. And it it really it, it really is awesome how all of you are working with your flawed characters and bring them, you know, bring them out and allow the reader to empathize with them and uh, and follow their steps. Joe, did you, we are way over, but there is so much I could talk about to you guys with these books. I just adore them the, the in interesting um structures that you've that you've all chosen or joe's the role in joe's book of, of humor self-deprecating humor and all, it's just like it's it's absolutely awesome i am not sure laura if i should stop um you know or if we should just keep going but i just wanted to uh to say again it's it's absolutely awesome you know to chat with you and um and your books are absolutely terrific if you have a second please drop in your social media or where you can be reached maybe your website or the social media um account that you would like readers to connect with you i forgot to ask you to do that in the beginning so maybe you can do that now or maybe laura maybe you can do this i'm not sure if we have it readily available <clears throat> All right. Okay. Here's Marcy Instagram. Okay. That's Michael. my favorite platform. Like, okay. I'm on all of them, but I don't like them. It was my favorite too until it was hacked. And I, I haven't even gotten a new account yet. No. But I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I enjoyed doing this. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for chatting with me this morning. Did everybody get a chance to put it down? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for chatting with me this morning. And again, it's absolutely awesome books. Please check us out um, on the Edelweiss catalog that Laura has just dropped into the chat um, and connect with our authors on the social media accounts that they've just, uh, just noted down. Thank you very much. And we'll chat soon.